All right, so welcome everyone. Thank you for logging on and attending this evening's program. My name is Matt Schumann. I am on the programming team here at Cary Library. Uh, before we begin, uh, please let me know in the chat if there's any technical issues that I can try to resolve. If you have any questions or comments for our speaker tonight, please send them via the Q&A uh, and we'll address them at the end. Also, if you do not want to see uh, chat pre previews while the program is going on, there's uh, an arrow next to the chat button on the bottom. Uh, and if you click that, you should be able to hide uh, chat previews there. I'd like to thank the generous donors to the Cary Library Foundation for helping make tonight's program possible, as well as Lexington Living Landscapes. Uh, tonight is part of an ongoing series of presentations where the library is partnering with Lexington Living Landscapes um, to bring experts in landscape and conservation issues to the public. So now, please welcome Charlie Wyman. Hi, good evening and welcome. We're delighted to have you with us this evening. I'm Charlie Wyman with Lexington Living Landscapes. And before I turn the floor over to Amy, let me say a word about who we are for any of you not familiar with us. We're a local nonprofit promote more sustainable landscaping practices in town. So native plants, fewer invasives, fewer chemicals, more trees. We grew out of a collaboration between the town's Sustainable Lexington Committee and three nonprofits, the Lexington Field and Garden Club, the Lexington Climate Action Network, and Citizens for Lexington Conservation. You can learn more about us, including how to sign up for our newsletter at our website, www.lexingtonlivinglandscapes.org. Our great thanks to Amy for joining us this evening and sharing her wisdom with us. And thank you as always to Matt and our friends at Cary Library for hosting this evening's program. After Amy's presentation, we'll have a Q&A session moderated by me. If you have questions, please put them in the Q&A, not the chat. We will be monitoring the chat, but place them in the Q&A and we'll get to as many of them as we can. Let me now introduce our speaker and get out of the way. I've gotten to know Amy through the Mystic Charles Pollinator Pathways Group, which those of you in the western suburbs of Boston uh, should get to know, and through our joint service on the steering committee of the Massachusetts Pollinator Network. I've really come to value both her contributions and her generosity. She is a font of wisdom and always ready to answer uh, a question or send information. Amy is on the research team in the Natural Solutions Working Group of Elders Climate Action, and the steering committee of the Massachusetts Pollinator Network and is an active member of Grow Native Massachusetts. She has been researching and gardening with native plants for over 10 years. I've heard her talk on this subject before and you are in for a treat this evening. Amy, thank you for joining us this evening. The floor is yours. Thanks so much, Charlie. And thank you, Matt of the library. I'm really happy to be here and I'm happy to be hosted by Lexington Living Landscapes because they really do a lot of wonderful work and I learn a lot from the newsletters. So I'm going to share my screen. Okay, that looks more promising. Yeah, there you go. Okay, everybody see my slideshow? Yep, you're good. Great. Okay, so tonight I'm going to be talking about gardening with native plants and why it's so important to do that because they provide essential habitat for many species and I'll also talk about how to do it. And the topics I'm going to cover are the biodiversity crisis. I'm starting with that because we I think we generally hear a lot less about that than the climate crisis but it's equally important. I'm going to talk about how native plants and trees have co-evolved with insects and birds and other species so that they depend on each other for survival. And then um, I have a section about how to take action to support biodiversity and also address climate change by using native plants in our gardens and landscapes. At the end, I have resource slides that I won't go through in detail. I'll just show you um, what they cover, but uh, you'll be getting a link to a recording of this presentation, and with it, I'll send a PDF of the resource slide so everyone will have access to that information. So starting with the biodiversity crisis, um, all the latest reports that we've gotten from the UN on climate change, including a joint report by the climate and biodiversity scientists, tell us that climate change and biodiversity loss are equally threatening to our well-being and actually our survival. 
And at this point, there's about a million animal and plant species around the world that are declining in numbers and at risk of extinction, many within decades. And the reports are also saying that we need to deal with these crises together to avoid un inadvertently making them worse. Another report came out uh, just this winter based on 50 years of research um, saying that in the United States, 34% of plant species, 40% of animal species, and 41% of ecosystems are at risk of extinction. So I'm starting with the bad news, but then I'm going to tell you how we can reverse this and take action. Um, so some statistics about the um, species that are declining in numbers. We've lost almost 3 billion birds, which is almost 30% of our bird population since 1970 in North America. And a major reason for the loss of birds is a loss of a really important food source for them, which is insects. So there are adult birds that eat insects and insects are also really important for um, the baby birds. And I'll, I'll go into some detail about that. About 41% of insect species are declining in numbers around the world. And insect populations are falling so quickly that they could be gone by the end of the century. In Massachusetts, we have about 400 species of native bees, many of which are declining. But I wanna say here that honeybees are not included in that. They're not native. As a species, they're not at risk and they actually compete with native bees for resources. So I'm gonna be talking about um, our native bees, not honeybees in this presentation. And it's not too late for us to take action. Um, on the upper right is a picture of the great northern bumblebee, which is one of the bees in Massachusetts that's um, declining. And there's a researcher out of UMass Dartmouth named Rob Gajir who's been studying which plant species the at-risk insects need for their survival. So that bee is in a Monarda plant. We know which plants um, those bees need. And if we start using these plants in our gardens, we can start reversing um, the decline in numbers. So E.O. Wilson was a renowned naturalist and biologist who died last year. And he said, if all mankind were to disappear, the world would regenerate back to the rich state of equilibrium that existed 10,000 years ago. But if insects were to vanish, the environment would collapse into chaos. And I find that interesting because I think most of us are brought up to see insects as either dangerous or disgusting or insignificant. And in fact, we need them for our survival. They're a really important part of keeping all ecosystems functioning. So insects pollinate many of our food crops. So without them, we don't get fruits and vegetables. Um, they pollinate 90% of flowering plants. So plants are depending on them to reproduce. They, insects are food for many species, as you can see illustrated here by the adult bird bringing an insect to the young. And then there are many species that eat the species that eat insects. So they're an important part of the food chain. They help with the decomposition. So anything that dies, um, insects help in returning it back to nutrients in the soil to help um, you know, feed other species. There are also insects in soils that help sequester carbon. So they're helpful in um, dealing with climate change. And there was a report that came out last year showing that um, there's an estimate of about 400,000 people around the world are dying as a result of the decline in pollinators and uh, as a result of that, a lack of food for people to eat, having a big impact on human health and mortality. So the causes for insect decline are, you can see there's a number of them, but the greatest cause is habitat loss. Um, a lot of people assume it's climate change. That's actually not true, especially in temperate zones. Uh, so here's some examples. Industrial agriculture plants huge fields of monocrops, uses lots of pesticide and herbicides, which, usually, uh, which either kill insects directly or you know, poison food that they might be looking for. Um, deforestation is another cause because forests are really important um, 
providers of food and shelter for many species, including insects. And then urbanization, you can see in this picture, you know, anything that's just hardscape like that, there's nothing there for insects. We actually can make a big difference in cities by planting trees and gardens and planting our parks. So um, cities can be a, a big help in reversing the decline in insects. And then another cause is our widespread use of non-native plants. And I'll be explaining in some detail how non-native plants don't provide essential support to local insects. Then pesticides, herbicides, and fertilizers all are harmful. Invasive plants and insects also either directly destroy insects or destroy their habitat. Um, I'll talk a little bit about light pollution. Um, that also is really disruptive to insect feeding and reproduction. And climate change definitely has an impact. I mean, you know, you think about huge flooding, hurricanes, fires, that's all destructive of habitat too. So it's important to work on both fronts, both being aware of supporting biodiversity and also um, addressing climate change. So in this section, I'm going to talk about how native plants and insects and birds and fungi have evolved to be dependent on each other. All species are connected, but I'm just focusing on these few. And I'm going to give some definitions first, so you'll have a better idea of what I'm talking about. Um, native plants are plants that co-evolve with other species in a given ecoregion, and they give each other um, multiple benefits. And people have different definitions about, or different um, ideas about how to draw the boundary around what's native in a given area. Some people will look for plants from Massachusetts or plants from New England or plants east of the Mississippi. Uh, but the important thing is that the plants are supporting insects that are um, local to them through their life cycle. And I'll explain that. It's not just going to the flower and getting food. It's also supporting the next generation. Non-native plants are plants that have been imported from other continents and other ecoregions. So for example, plants from California are not native to New England. And then even plants that were brought here hundreds of years ago don't develop the ability to support local insects. And I'll explain that too. Invasive plants are non-native plants that grow very aggressively and they crowd out native plants. Um, sometimes they crowd them from underground. Some invasive plants exude a chemical that poisons the roots of plants around them and that allows them to take over more territory. Others, as you can see in this picture, can grow really fast and climb. And I'm sure you've seen roadsides where there's um, vines smothering trees to the point where they actually can take them down. So taking out invasive plants is really an important thing to do to um, help our ecosystem, ecosystems be healthy and recover. Insects and native plants have been evolving together for 125 million years. And the result of that is that plants depend on insects to pollinate them in order to reproduce. Insects depend on plants for food, both for the adults that are gathering food and for their offspring. And again, I'll explain that. And plants have um, developed the ability to defend themselves against being devoured by insects by um, providing toxic chemicals that are, make them either unpalatable or poisonous to insects. And they have some other defenses too, but this is a major one. And it's interesting that a lot of these chemicals are uh, things that we use as medicine for ourselves. And insects have evolved the ability to bypass plant toxicity, but only for very specific plants. They don't do it for all plants. And the result of that is that plants and insects have developed very specialized relationships so that 90% of insects require specific plants for food, either for themselves or their offspring, and they can't survive without those particular plants. And matching that, most plants can only be pollinated by limited species of insects. So they've developed kind of matching chemical and physical traits that allow them to uh, benefit from each other. And I'll show you a few examples of that. There are dozens of examples and it's pretty fascinating, um, but I'll just show you a few. And as I've said, this took eons. And 
I've had people say, you know, well, why can't a plant that's been here 400 years provide benefits to insects? And um, a good analogy is that, you know, imagine you like to go hiking, you're in the woods, you get lost, you run out of food, and you're there for days. It would be really convenient if we could get nutrition from chewing tree twigs, but we can't. There's a lot of plants that we can't eat. And it's the same kind of thing with insects and flowering plants. There's only certain ones that they can benefit from and others that are not useful to them. So also most hybridized plants don't provide benefit to insects the way native plants do. And I'll explain that also. So here's a few examples of these specialized relationships. Um, this one has to do with physical traits. So both these Monarda plants have long, thin tubular flowers, and they can only be pollinated by insects with long tongues. So insects have different length tongues depending on what kind of flower they pollinate. So there are long tongue bees and long tongue moths that can reach down and get the nectar out of the base of the flower. Hummingbirds with their long thin beaks can also pollinate flowers like this. And they're the only pollinating bird in North America. There are other continents that have other birds that pollinate. We also, I mean, we do have other pollinators too, bats, beetles, ants, but I'm gonna be talking about um, mostly bees and butterflies and moths. So another example of um, compatible physical traits, the blue gentian flower on the lower left has the flowers never open, they're tightly closed. And these other two flowers here also have pretty thick, tight petals. And only bumblebees are big and strong enough to get into those flowers to pollinate them. Another thing they do is um, they buzz to shake pollen loose, which makes them very effective pollinators. Um, and I have family members who every summer now send me pictures of flowers with bees sticking out of the back. and Everybody enjoys that. I can spend ages in the garden watching bees and flowers. It's just amazing and listening to them, watching them, um, it's fascinating. So here's a specialized chemical relationship. So I'm sure you've all heard that monarchs are in trouble and that they need milkweed. And the reason is, um, well, let me go through this little story. On the left-hand side is a milkweed plant and that white dot on the leaf is a monarch butterfly egg. Monarch butterflies can go to a number of flowers uh, to get nectar, but they only lay their eggs on milkweed because you can see the uh, caterpillar on the right. When the eggs hatch, the caterpillars can only eat milkweed leaves. And milkweed has really thick, milky sap, which um, is unpalatable or poisonous to other insects. And these caterpillars sometimes will bite the top of the vein and let some of the sap run out before they eat the leaf. But they can eat the leaf and not be harmed by the sap. So here's the story about how hybridized plants are often not very helpful. I'm using Echinacea as an example. You can see on the upper left, that's the original straight species of an Echinacea flower. And you can see three different kinds of butterflies on that plant. On the right, you can see a goldfinch getting seeds off the plant in the fall. So in general, native plants provide nectar for adult insects. They provide pollen and leaves, which is um, what gets fed to the offspring of bees and moths and butterflies. They develop seed, which birds can eat in the fall and the winter. And because they're being pollinated by insects that are carrying pollen from flower to flower, they have genetic variability. And that's always been important, but I think it's even more important now as we're dealing with climate change because we're having such intense weather events. So if all the plants were the same, they could all get wiped out by a heat wave or by you know, a drought. Whereas if there's genetic variability, there might be some um, characteristics in some of the flowers that allow them to withstand these events and continue and not, and so the whole species doesn't get wiped out. So the difference between the, the native plant species and the hybridized plant is that for one thing, the hybridized plant has been altered by humans for, for our pleasure. So 
here's an example of echinacea flowers that have been altered purely for their form and color. And these plants no longer produce nectar or pollen or seeds. And so they're, they're basically just decorative plants that you put in your garden that really don't interact with the ecosystem at all. There are echinacea plants where just the colors change or the heights change. They're not this um, extreme in how they've been changed. But often those plants have reduced nutrition available in their nectar and pollen. I don't know specifically for echinacea, but for most hybridized plants, that's often the case. Even if they look similar, like the flower might just be a little bigger, but the uh, nutritional value has been diminished. And some change shapes make them non-functional. Like I know that there's a hybrid of um, Lobelia cardinalis, the red cardinal flower. It looks very similar to the original. It's a little bit bigger and it's big enough that those long tongued insects can't reach the nectar anymore. And because these have been hybridized and growers are wanting to, you know, create a lot of them to sell, they're clones. So the genetic variation is lost. So there are some hybridized plants that retain some ecological value, but if you're shopping for plants uh, for maximum you know, biodiversity support, it's safest to get the original species, unless you're talking to someone who's really knowledgeable. I mean, some of the native plant growers know that there's a goldenrod or you know, an echinacea that's still valuable. Um, but other, if it has a name after the Latin name in quotes, it's a hybrid. And then you know, you need to wonder if this is still really um, providing support to insects and birds. So Doug Tallamy um, created this chart. He's a really amazing teacher. He's written books. It's great to find some of his um, lectures on YouTube. Uh, Grow Native Massachusetts has some of them stored on their website. And he created this uh, chart showing how native plants don't develop um, the ability to support local, e local ecosystems. So the list of names on the left are plants that were brought here from other continents. The column of numbers next to that list shows how many species they support in their original range where they came from. So that's between 40 and over 400 species. The next column shows how many species they support in North America, and that's between zero and eight. And then the last column shows you how long they've been in North America, and it's between 100 and th over 300 years. So that's an illustration of how plants don't develop the ability to provide support to local insects at the, in the, at the same level that native plants do. So here's an example with trees. Ginkgo trees are native to China. They're widely planted as street trees here because they're resilient and they're pretty. Um, they support one species in the United States and they've been here well over 200 years. Oak trees are really the most beneficial plant you can put in the ground if you have room for it. They support over 500 species of insects, birds, and mammals, and over 400 of those are insects. So in general, native plants support 13 times more insect species than non-natives, and non-native plants on average support zero to five insect species. So uh, I was talking about how uh, native plants support insect reproduction. So for moths and butterflies, they lay their eggs on leaves. When the eggs hatch, the caterpillars eat the leaves, like I was showing you with uh, the milkweed and monarch connection. And thousands of caterpillars are needed as food for just one nest of baby birds. I'll show you some research about that. And the vast majority of caterpillars can only eat the leaves from very specific plant species. So those plants are called host plants. And here's an example on the right. That's a spice bush butterfly. That's the spice bush caterpillar, which is really cute, but those aren't really big eyes. Those are just markings to make them look a little intimidating. So birds leave them alone. And the spice bush uh, caterpillar can only eat spice bush leaves. So that's where the butterfly will lay its eggs. And it's similar with native bees. They collect pollen from plants to store in their nests. And again, uh, they're different from the honeybees that I think most of us know 
a lot about. Most native bees are solitary, so they make tunnels in the ground, they make tunnels in wood, they lay eggs in the tunnels, they create pollen balls that they put next to the eggs, and when the eggs hatch, the larvae eat the pollen. And again, most bees can only eat pollen from specific plants, and those are the host plants for bees. So in order to have the next generation of pollinators, we need to have host plants. And I'm gonna uh, show you, I'll give you resources so you can see what the host plants are. But what this cycle means is that um, there's gonna be holes and leaves, which I've learned to be excited about when I see that in my garden. So you can see on the right, there's a really healthy birch tree. And here's a close up on the left of some leaves and there's holes chewed in them. And it means that there's either moth or butterfly larva feeding on the leaves and they'll either grow up to be moths and butterflies or they'll get eaten as caterpillars and feed birds. So it's a good sign to have holes in your leaves. Now this is different from huge infestations which are usually from non-native um, caterpillars. Those tent caterpillars, you know, the defoliate trees, that doesn't happen with native species. There's this balance where they're, they're not harming the tree um, there's enough food for them on the tree, the tree's fine, and all these other species get fed. So Desiree Narango was a student of Doug Tallamy's who did this very interesting research on how many caterpillars birds need and how many native plants need to be in the area to support the birds. So what she found is chickadees, and you know how little they are, need six to 9,000 caterpillars to raise one nest of birds. And this is even before the birds have fledged. You know, you've maybe seen them hopping around on the ground with parents bringing them food. This is how many they need while they're still in the nest. And what she found is if there weren't enough woody native plants in the area, there wasn't enough food for the birds. So uh, there are herbaceous plants that, um, that support caterpillars like milkweed, but it's mostly trees and shrubs that um, caterpillars are feeding on. So what she found is if there were between 90% and 94 and 100% native woody plants in the area, the birds did really well. When the amount of native woody biomass, meaning not the number of plants, but the mass of um, plant material, if that dropped below 70%, some of the birds starved. There just wasn't enough food for them. So people are using this as a rule of thumb that we need at least 70% native plant biomass to support a functioning ecosystem with enough food for different species to reproduce. So here, this is um, the top keystone plants of the Northeast. They're about 5% of native plant species that feed 75% of insect species. So these are known as the keystone plants. Um, and this list is not exhaustive. So there's sort of the top trees on the left and the top herbaceous plants and the blueberry shrub on the right. So those are all highly beneficial plants. But if you go to the Grow Native website uh, to this link, they have a very long list of keystone plants. So those are good plants to know about if you're adding native plants to your um, property or landscaping you know that those are gonna support uh, a lot of insect species and also support their reproduction. So here's an example of um, a bumblebee on a blueberry bush pollinating the flowers. So if we didn't have bumblebees, we wouldn't have blueberries. I'm gonna talk about what goes on underground too because that's another really important part of a functioning healthy ecosystem. Um, you can see on the left, mushrooms, which look really familiar. Those are actually the fruiting body of this vast ne network of fibers underground that are called mycorrhizal fungi. So the fibers are always there and there are many different kinds and they provide many different functions. Um, and they're all over the world and the mushrooms just pop up when they're reproducing. So mycorrhiza connect to roots of plants they transfer nutrients between plants. They transfer water between plants and to plants. They also are really important, not only in transferring carbon between plants, but storing it in the ground. So healthy soil is 
a really important part of addressing climate change too, because it's, it's so helpful in carbon storage. Uh, the fungi protect plants from disease. And in return, um, they don't photosynthesize, which plants do. So plants are um, able to create sugars that they feed to the, the mycorrhizal fungi. So they have this beneficial exchange where the fungi is getting food from the plants, and then it's also providing services that help the plants stay healthy. Suzanne Samard is a researcher in the Pacific Northwest, and she's in one of my um, resource slides with books. She wrote a book called Finding the Mother Tree, and she's done a lot of this research, and it's really fascinating reading about it. Uh, let's see. I think I've said everything in that list. So. Um, it also seems that the mycorrhizal relationships with plants helps plants become more resilient to climate change. And the reason for this is the fungi reproduce and evolve quickly. So you can see this, you know, if you go out for a walk after a rain and mushrooms have popped up, they're reproducing. And that happens obviously much faster than how a tree can reproduce. And they're evolving to support their partner plants because they depend on them. And because they reproduce so frequently, they can adapt to changing conditions. So one of the stories in Suzanne Samard's book, which I think can illustrate how this could work, is uh, she was talking about a hillside that was had a lot of moisture at the bottom of the hill and was very dry on the top. And these mycorrhizal fungi were ferrying water from the moist area at the bottom of the hill to the trees that needed it at the top. So it was helping the trees survive this, these dry conditions. So native plants have evolved these mutually beneficial relationships with fungi, which helps keep our ecosystems more resilient. And so, so soil health is both important for supporting biodiversity and, as I said, increasing carbon storage. And there are things we can do to help protect soil health. One is to minimize tilling. So I know if you're planting something, you have to dig a hole in the ground. So it's not that you never dig into the ground, but just avoid digging more than you need to so that you're not breaking up these connections between the plants and the fungi. And then avoiding chemical use is important because as I said, it poisons insects, but it also harms plants and it harms the uh, fungi and the micro microorganisms in the soil. So this includes, um, uh, chemical fertilizers also are not helpful to soil. There's research showing that um, the greater diversity of plant species there are, the greater the diversity of the fungi are present, the healthier the plants are, and the more carbon gets stored in the soil. So that's, that's pretty interesting to know. So monoculture crops do not provide that kind of function. So that includes things like lawns or tree plantations. Diversity creates a healthier ecosystem. So fallen leaves are really helpful. They break down and provide really essential nutrients that are helpful to soil. And as I described how destructive invasive plants are, it's important to remove them to protect soil health. And as part of um, the Massachusetts roadmap to getting to net zero by climate 50, which was re uh, released two years ago, they just released a Healthy Soils Action Plan as part of that roadmap. So it's part of our climate strategy to protect healthy soil. And it's that's a pretty interesting report. It's huge, but it's interesting. So now I'm gonna talk about how do we put this into practice? How do we garden to support biodiversity? And this is a picture of my backyard in Cambridge, a shady area with all these shade plants. So early on, I talked about how loss of habitat was the major reason for the decline in all these species. And there isn't enough wild habitat left outside of our developed lands to support all these species that are at risk. There are 40 million acres in the US are planted in lawns, which is equal to the acreage of our continental national parks. In Massachusetts, 20% of our land is in lawn. And lawns are ecosystem deserts. You can see this is a monoculture. There's nothing flowering in it. A lot of people use pesticides and herbicides on their lawns. So they're poisoning anything that's there. So there's nothing for any species to um, get nutrition from. 
And then as contrast, this is just a strip along the side of a street, but there's so many different flowers that are gonna provide nectar and pollen and seeds. Um, the roots also help filter water. So this is just a much uh, more supportive way of um, taking care of a planted area to support a lot of species. Here's another way of illustrating this. On the far left is turf grass. You can see how tiny it is, how short the roots are. It's storing a teeny bit of carbon, but not much. It's mostly just keeping soil from blowing away. And you can see this variety of flower shapes and plant species, how deep the roots are, just all the different kinds of insects and birds these plants can support. And uh, all the carbon the roots can store and how much water it can absorb during, you know, the flooding rain events we've been getting. So back to Doug Tallamy, the entomologist I was talking about, he has started, I think it's a movement and it's also a website called Homegrown National Park. And he's recommending that we, if we all planted half of our lawns with at least 70% native habitat, we could really reverse this biodiversity crisis. Um, and there's a number of ways of doing this. This is a picture, I don't remember which suburb of Boston this picture is from, but um, this house used to have just nothing but lawn in front of it. And a couple of years ago, the homeowner decided to plant native trees and shrubs and grasses and flowering plants. So this is becoming really fantastic life supporting habitat. Um, a lot of us don't have that kind of space or we don't have that kind of money, but there's ways to provide beneficial habitat on a much smaller scale. I mean, if you can do this, it's fantastic. That's a lot of benefit, but whatever you can do is really helpful. So you can look, if you have a lawn, look at it and think about how much of it do you actually use for recreation, for walking paths? And do you have areas where you could turn it over into this kind of native planting? And if you live somewhere where you you know, you don't have space, you can use a window box or a pot and grow native plants in it. And that's helpful too. And you can also, even if you eventually wanna do something big, you can always start in one area so it's manageable and build from there. Actually, I'm gonna go back and say one more thing. When I first learned about um, the loss of insects, maybe about 10 or 12 years ago, I had a big flowering garden with almost no native plants in it. I hadn't known anything about that. And my first decision was just whenever I have a hole in the garden, I'm gonna put in a native plant. So that was how I got started. I mean, since then I've actually given all my non-native plants away and my garden's almost completely native habitat, but you know, start where you're comfortable and take it as far as you want to take it. So I don't know if people have been talking about the no mow may very much in Lexington. Uh, it was a big thing last year. I don't know if people are talking about it this year. I'm gonna mention it just in case it's still on people's minds. Um, I think, so the idea was to not mow your lawn during May. And the reason was, is, so that um, the lawn could get longer, flowers can bloom in it, and it provides flowers for the insects that are just emerging from hibernation or just hatching from eggs. And they, they're, you know, they're just arriving, they really need nutrition. Um, and so that's beneficial. It's also beneficial, I think, for people to get used to not having a manicured lawn, to see that as something acceptable, and to realize that we need to support the insects in our regions and that this is one way of doing it. So I, I think there are principles about it that are um, helpful things for people to learn. The downsides are, um, the month that you don't mow or the, um, the period of time that you don't mow depends on your region. I think May really is pretty good for us, uh, but the most important thing about it is not mowing until insects have had a chance to emerge and collect food. Um, if you've been treating your lawn with pesticides, you're not gonna get food. Um, so that's a downside. And insects need support throughout the whole year, not just in May. So it's, it's not enough to decide not to mow in May and then go back to mowing every week and keeping a kind of sterile lawn. Um, so it's, it's kind of a gateway to learning about the importance of native plants supporting insects. Um, 
So I, again, I think the good thing about it is that a lawn that's mown less frequently, that has flowers growing in it, that's pesticide free, is much better than a conventional lawn. And I'm actually gonna talk more about how you can have that kind of lawn, um, but it's more beneficial to plant native plant habitat. But, you know, there's um, compromises we can make. If you have some lawn, there's ways to make it more beneficial than the conventional ways of taking care of it. So you can see on the left, there's uh, on the left side of this picture, there's lawn that's been allowed to get uh, long enough so that there's flowers in it that insects can visit for food. Um, and then on the right, you can see a lawn that's being kept very short. So there's almost nothing in it for insects to benefit from. So um, guidelines for keeping a uh, lawn that will support some biodiversity is to mow every two to three weeks, allow your grass height to stay at three to four inches, leave the clippings on the ground because they're fertilizer for the grass. You don't need artificial fertilizer. You can leave the clippings, avoid all artificial chemicals, and then allow small flowering plants to bloom in the lawn. And you can either allow them or add them. And I'll talk about what you can add. And what will happen is um, pollinating insects will visit the lawn and then birds will follow them because birds are looking for insects as food. So you actually get this kind of fun habitat to watch. You know, you can start learning what's coming to your lawn. You see bird activity. So it's much more interesting than a conventional lawn, even just from the perspective of our looking at it. Um, this page is from the Wild Seed Project, which is a really great organization in Maine. Um, they have a whole handout on how to diversify your lawn, which you can access on their website. So this page will be in the resource um, packet that you get. So on the left are plants that you can actually that you can put in your lawn that are beneficial, um, both native and non-native plants that are helpful. In the middle are a list of plants you can allow in the lawn. They're helpful, they're not harmful. And then on the right are plants that you should take out because they're either so aggressive they're going to crowd out other plants or they're toxic and invasive. Um, so you'll have access to this. And then how to get started planting natives. Um, the beginning, when you're thinking about it, is very similar to starting any garden. You need to think about and, and look at how much light are you getting? Where, you know, Depending on the area you're planting, are you getting a lot of sun? Do you have part shade? Is it deeper shade? How much moisture do you have? Um, and then what kind of habitat do you want there? Do you want to start the way I did and just add native plants to a bed that you already have? Do you want to start a new garden bed? Do you want to turn some of your lawn over to trees? Do you want to create a woodland? You can create a meadow. And as I said, you can diversify the lawn that you do keep. Something to keep in mind about gardening is that in nature, Plants grow very densely together. Um, there's ground covers, there's taller plants, there's shrubs and trees. So the style of gardening where you have a shrub surrounded by bark mulch and another plant over here surrounded by bark mulch, that's not how nature operates. Um, I think that was developed for landscapers to have an easy job, not having to weed and not worrying about plants mingling together. <laughs> um, but if you look at this picture, this is again, my shade garden, but plants grow together the way they do in nature. And then you don't need mulch um, to keep the soil moist. The plants will do that for you. And then again, um, no matter what kind of landscape you have, take the invasives out and keep checking for them because they keep coming back. So the goals of a native garden are to plan for a variety of native flowers that will be in bloom from early spring all the way till frost because there's insects that emerge at different times. There's insects that migrate at the end of the season, like mon monarchs need to get a lot of nutrition to be able to fly to Mexico in the fall. Uh, and there's all these different insects, you know, with different plant preferences. Um, so having a big variety of plants through the whole growing season is really helpful. If you have room to plant in groups, it makes foraging easier. Honeybees can fly five miles to get food, which is one of the ways they compete with native bees, because most of them can go no further than like 400 yards. 
So it's helpful to help the native bees conserve energy by having your flowers in groups where they can, you know, quickly forage in a small area. Then you want to include keystone plants, the ones that support the most species. So um, you'll get the link to a list of those. Again, um, if you can, you know, the ideal is to grow at least 70% native biomass. And then prioritize the plants that support the insects in Massachusetts that are endangered. So I mentioned Rob Gajir, the entomologist. Um, this is a link to a spreadsheet that has the plant, the um, yeah, the plants that he's determined are helpful to the insects that are at risk in our region. And the spreadsheet will show you the Latin name, the common name, the bloom time, the height, the spread, how much moisture, how much sun it needs. So it's it's helpful for looking through, you know, if you know you need plants that need dry conditions, you can start with that column. Um, and then I'll tell you other ways to do more research with plants. But this is a nice way to start a plant list so you know you're helping the insects that really need it. And then maintaining a garden that supports biodiversity is also different from how most of us were taught to garden. It, it, it requires a change in habit and thinking about um, what our priorities are. So um, it's important to skip cleaning up in the fall. I think we were taught to take out everything that's turned brown, take out leaves, take out dry plant stems. Um, but there's insects that are overwintering in the plant stems. There are eggs in the plant stems. And there are a lot of insects that overwinter in the leaves on the ground. So when you're throwing all that dead material out, you're actually throwing out the next generation of insects. So it's good to wait until spring to clean up. Um, I also want to say that it's a different aesthetic in the garden, and I've come to love it because you have plant stems up in different shades, mostly brown, but very different shape, dried flower heads, seed pods. Um, so birds will come eat some of the seeds in the winter, but they're like little sculptures. And then when it snows, it's a whole other kind of beauty that you're looking at. So um, you don't have to just do it for the benefit of the insects. You can do it for your own enjoyment too. So in the spring, you want to wait till we have just about a week of temperatures that don't drop below 50 degrees at night. Um, and then you can cut your plant stems to 12 or 15 inches. There might still be insects in there. Um, your plants will grow up around those stems and hide them. The ones that I cut down, I put to the side in case there's still insects that are going to emerge from there. So I have a little pile. Um, if my leaves are so thick, you don't want to have really thick, wet, matted leaves because they might rot the crowns of plants that are coming up. So I will gently, you know, if they're really thick, pull them away and put them in a leaf pile. If you let them decompose, they're really great compost and um, fertilizer. And I leave some leaves on the ground because that's good mulch and fertilizer, just not so thick that they um, will make it hard for plants to come up. And then all the debris that nature leaves lying around is helpful to all these different species as shelter. So if you have space to leave rocks, to leave even standing dead tree snags, you know, take off any limbs that could fall off, or dead wood on the ground, um, those all provide good shelter. Now, I know a lot of people live in neighborhoods where the neighbors get upset, or you might even have a homeowners association, you know, rule that you're not allowed to, you know, let your lawn get too warm or something. So, some, you know, there are a few things you can do. You can make the edges tidy. So let's say you've decided to let your lawn grow into a meadow. If you mow around the edge, you're showing that you're doing something on purpose. Um, you can put up a pollinator habitat sign. So you're showing there's a purpose. And actually with the sign, people might get curious and talk to you. You might have a chance to educate people. So I know that can be an issue, but there are some ways of managing that. And then um, insects and birds both need water. So if you can provide a water source, that's really helpful. Obviously, you don't want to let it sit so that mosquitoes are breeding in it. But if you refresh it every two or three days, it keeps it clean and you won't get a mosquito problem. Um, it's good to put pebbles in it because insects need a place to stand 
um, while they're drinking, which I always find amusing to think about. Um, and then again, I talked about how damaging nightlight is. It's really in the last 50 years that we're just lighting everything up at night everywhere. And none of us evolved with that for that, neither our species nor any others. And it's damaging to our health as well as really fatal to other species. So if you can leave your lights off at night, that's best. Um, if there's reasons why you can't, if you switch to bulbs that lean towards the yellow end of the spectrum instead of cold blue, that's less damaging. If you can put your lights on motion sensors so they only go on when you need them, that's really helpful too. There's a lot more information about this. The Dark Sky Association um, is a, I think it's an international organization now. They have great information on their website. So we're also adapting to climate change. And so that's something to think about when you're planting. Um, you know, as I mentioned, and we all know, we're dealing with more heat, more drought, more flooding rains. And so finding the right plants for your current climate conditions and your site conditions is helpful. Um, people are not really recommending that we try to anticipate that plants from far south of us are gonna do best here. Nature's really complicated and that's a little risky, um, but there are things we can do. So in my front garden in Cambridge near a really hot street, when we have these heat waves in the summer, it's shady, but my shade plants got pretty miserable by the middle of every summer for a few years in a row. You know, they turn brown like this. So I put them in my backyard, which is just yards away, but it's not next to the hot street and they do very well there. There's other woodland plants that I also, I knew I couldn't plant in the front because um, they like moisture conditions and they do well in my backyard too. So the important thing is to assess what your growing conditions are and find the right plant that will be happy in that spot. And I'll, I'll talk about ways to uh, do that research. So I've, I've talked a fair amount about pesticides. I don't think I need to go through this whole slide. Just you know, they kill insects, they kill plants. Um, they also seep into waterways and damage aquatic life. They damage the life below ground. One thing to know is they can last for years in soil and plants. So it's important to buy plants that have not been treated with pesticides because you might be buying a plant that's gonna poison the insects that you're trying to attract. Um, so that's something to talk about at nurseries or go to native plant nurseries that you know don't use chemicals. Some people with really big invasive plant problems um, will use an herbicide really carefully to control it, but I would never go to a company that's sort of indiscriminately <laughs> poisoning insects and plants as part of their business plan because they're not gonna be careful about the rest of the environment. I would talk to somebody with, um, who's really caring about the health of the environment to get advice before you do anything like that. So how to shop for native plants or look for native plants. Again, um, for the greatest benefit to local species, you want to get the native plant species, not hybrids or cultivars, you know, with the few exceptions where you should get advice before you get cultivars. Um, and I'm not saying you should never buy them. I mean, this is your garden, you know, and it doesn't have to be 100% native. And if you see something you love and you want to plant it, it's fine as long as it's not invasive. I'm just talking about what to do for the greatest um, biodiversity support. You want to get plants grown without pesticides. If you can get plants grown from seed, we'll have the greatest um, genetic variability, which is really helpful for resilience. And again, be, care be careful about um, things that are marketed as plants for pollinators, because a lot of people are hopping on that bandwagon because it's a nice marketing slogan. But unless they're specifying that the plants are, or seeds are native to our region, you don't really know what you're gonna get. So if you're not at a native plant nursery, um, you can talk to the nursery you're going to and tell them you want native plants, you want them grown pesticide free. The more they hear that, the more they'll know there's a demand and the more likely they are to bring those plants in. And I'm, I'm seeing that shift happening. If you're working with a landscaper, tell them that's what you want. Um, I prefer to shop at native plant nurseries because I just trust what they have. 
but there are plenty of other nurseries that are carrying native plants now and good native plants. So I have a spreadsheet. Again, you'll get access to this. The first is a page of nurseries that carry native plants. They're either local or they're mail order. The second page is uh, nurseries that are all native. And there's a lot more of those coming along too. This Wing and a Prayer Nursery is out in Western Mass in coming tenant. It's worth a field trip. It's a wonderful nursery with great plants, all different sizes, great prices, and it's beautiful habitat. It's very exciting to walk around there, all seed grown. Um, okay, I've got a couple more minutes before we should open up for Q&A. So I'm gonna talk a little about how I do plant research. When I needed drought resistant plants for my front garden, I'm gonna use that just as an, ex as an example. I went to the Native Plant Trust Plant Finder tool on their website. And you can put in whatever ever variables you want. So I, and the fewer you put in, the bigger the plant list you'll get. So I put in, I wanted the straight species, shade, drought resistant, and I got a list. Then I went to Prairie Moon Nursery website, which has even more information, just great pictures and great descriptions of the cultural needs of the plant. So that's another place to do research. You can also put in easy in their search box and you'll get a list of native plants that are easy to grow. Um, Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center has a lot of the same information, but they're in Texas, so their bloom times are not accurate for us. These other two, uh, well, Prairie Moon has good bloom times for us. Amanda's Garden is a little nursery in New York State, um, really the same eco region. And that's just a fun website to visit. And you can mail order from her. She has really great photos and descriptions and advice about growing native plants. And then again, here's the spreadsheet of plants that support the endangered insects in Massachusetts, which is a nice place to start. I'm not gonna go through the summary of garden practices because I've talked about all of this, but this will be in your packet just as you know, an easy reference to remember you know, what are the things to keep in mind. And I wanna talk a little about um, biodiversity and climate change because we can take action for both. And the most important things we can do are to protect and restore our nat native natural habitats, the forests, grasslands, wetlands, and soil. And I actually just learned mosses store huge amounts of carbon. They also support a lot of species. They keep soil moist. So if you have moss, keep it. Um, and as I said, Biodiverse ecosystems sequester the most carbon and support the most species, use plants native to the region. So one thing that's been on my mind a lot is that the states are now starting to get federal money to plant trees uh, to mitigate climate change. And I think it's really important for us to educate our policymakers that we need to plant native trees because we need to support biodiversity as much as we need to mitigate climate change. And we can do them at the same time by using native trees. Um, some of these things I've talked about, but I also want to mention peat moss because peat bogs store huge amounts of carbon. And when we dig them up to get peat to spread in our gardens, we're releasing the carbon. So we need to use alternatives. And that's one of the reasons why I'm advocating using fallen leaves that you just get in your neighborhood. And it's exciting when you do this, you'll see all kinds of wildlife come to your garden and it's really thrilling to see the flowers and the birds and all these different kinds of insects and start learning about them. So it's just a very pleasurable way to address some serious issues that we're dealing with. So these are my resource slides. Um, these are plant lists and these are organizations and websites that are really helpful. You can get connect with communities of people. You can get all kinds of information. Um, these are some national organizations. These are books and plant guides. So you'll have access to all of these slides. And I just wanna end with a quote from Robin Wall Kimmerer, who um, is a Native American from the Adirondack region. And she's also a professor of envi environmental biology. So she has both the Western science training and the native traditions behind her in her understanding of plants. And she said, in some native languages, the term for plants translates to 
those who take care of us. And now we need to take care of them. So I'm going to stop sharing. And here we are. Great, Amy. Um, thank you so much. That was fabulous, chock full of information. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, we've got about a half hour for questions. So um, we'll dig in in a second. Um, let me first um, just put in a plug um, for anyone who's um, interested in doing a deeper dive into a couple of topics that uh, Amy talked about. I recommend going to the Living Landscapes website mm -hmm. and go to um, events and then past event resources. And you'll find um, some great other great talks by um, some other speakers we've had, for instance, Kill Your Lawn by Dan Jaffe Wilder. Mm -hmm. um, if you're interested in light pollution, uh, James Lowenthal, who oh. is the chapter chair of the Massachusetts chapter of the International Dark Sky Association spoke to us a year ago. So some great resources there. And then let me also put in a plug for our next program, which is coming up on June 6th. Uh, Nick Dorian from Tufts is going to be talking about the secret lives of wild bees. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about uh, wild bees, um, Nick's the guy for you and please join us. That'll be our last uh, online program with uh, Carrie Library before we take a break for the summer. Uh, so Amy, we have a number of questions and I wanna uh, jump right in. And actually the first one is the only one that I can answer. So let me take okay. a crack at that. Great. Uh, Carolyn asks, may we share the recording of this presentation? And the simple answer is yes, absolutely. Um, in a couple of days, you'll get an email from Matt and it'll have a link to the recording as well as um, all the follow-up information that Amy has referenced, um, she'll send that along and Matt will send it out. So look for that in uh, the next couple of days. Um, the recording will also get posted to the uh, Cary Library's YouTube channel and is open for the world to see. So um, let your friends know. I also just want to say all the speakers you mentioned are fantastic. So I really recommend everyone follow your advice to uh, go back and listen to those recordings or attend that next meeting. Good, thank you, thank you. Um, Amy, Liz asks, what are the, you showed a slide a, a while back of someone who had converted their lawn, part of their lawn um, into um, native plant habitat. Mm -hmm. And she asks, what are the plants in the strip that was on the slide next oh, to the dear. lawn? Do you have a oh. sense of, if someone's looking to sort of recreate that kind of, that kind of um, scene, do you have, can you identify any of those plants or suggest what they might be? So that was the kind of the divided lawn. One was mown really short and one side No, nope, uh, it was the one where uh, it showed a suburban house. You said oh. it was in the greater Boston area probably. Mm -hmm. And there were strips along of native plants along the walk to it. They planted oh, some I trees see. as well. I don't actually know specifically what was planted there. So, um, hmm. yeah, that's sort of a, how should I get started? <laughs> what should I put in my garden question? You know, that's hard to answer on the fly. Yeah. Because, yeah. you know, you need to, again, how much sun do you have? How much shade do you have? How much moisture do you have? Um, Charlie, do you have a list on your website of consultants? for native gardening, because lots of people ask about that. You know, even if someone just comes over for two hours and says, these plants would do well here, I think that's really helpful to people. Yeah, and, and actually we do. Um, we have uh, on the website under resources for homeowners, there's, uh, I think it's called Garden Design Pros. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a list of them um, that have, told us that they would like to um, consult and have some expertise in native plants. And there's a subset of them that have said that for $100, they'll come and walk around your yard for an hour without any expectation of further, um, mm -hmm. further work and just give you the benefit of their advice and knowledge. So um, that's, we also have um, another page in that same section called do-it-yourself garden design. 
um, as you know, um, there are a number of organizations that uh, have created sort of garden design templates for different regions of the country. And there are a number in the Northeast, a number in, in Massachusetts. And so um, they that page has links where you can sort of have a, um, a design laid out for a sunny yard in Massachusetts um, made up of native plants. So, you know, for, uh, yes, just, go ahead. Am I interrupting you though? I don't know. No, if no, you're... no. Okay. Just one other thought is if you go to a meeting of the Mystic Charles Pollinator Pathway Group, um, so those you know, organizations are listed in one of the slides. You'll meet other people, and you know, if you don't want to spend money on a consultant, you can talk to people and get ideas, and maybe partner with somebody. That's another way to do it: is join a community and share information. Yeah, and and Mystic Charles is terrific, and they have a um, a Facebook page and uh, regular communication that happens there. They have Zoom meetings. Uh, I think it's. It's a Tuesday night. I forget whether it's the first or last Tuesday of the month. But uh, if you're on Facebook, go to Facebook, type in Mystic Dash Charles um, Pollinator Pathways, and uh, and you'll find them. Highly recommended. Great group. Um, Amy Liz also asked. Um, she noticed on one of your slides um, your advice to avoid B hotels. Right. Why, why do you say that? I say that because um, nature actually provides safer shelter than the shelter that we try to create. Um, I think it's kind of a sweet idea to help bees that way, but the problems with bee hotels are, they're made out of, I think usually bamboo, which is a lasting material. So um, natural bee habitat, you know, a bee will make a tunnel in wood. Eventually um, the bee will, will move out to find a better spot, or if it's a, branch on the ground, it'll decompose and it'll be forced to move. These bee hotels that we create last a really long time. They get dirty. They can be vectors for disease, um, partly because they last so long and partly because so many insects are together in one spot that they can kind of, COVID just came to mind, <laughs> kind of an unfortunate <laughs> reference, but um, you know they can pass disease to each other. They also become a place, they're insects that prey on other insects. Like I see wasps kind of hovering around my plants looking for insects to attack. They find that this is a great place to hang out and catch a meal. So I, I don't think it's all the worst thing in the world to do, but I think uh, letting insects find shelter in nature the way they always have um, is, is safer. Nature's worked this out over millennia and we're trying to be helpful, but we don't know as much. So, thank you. Um, Francesca asks, how does decomposed <laughs> decomposed leaves differ from compost as a fertilizer? Oh, um, I'm not an expert on this, but I think generally compost, depending on what it is, like you can have composted leaves, which are just leaves that have you know rotted and broken down, um, and so that that's leaf compost. Um, I think a lot of people are thinking about maybe compost that includes food or manure or other nutrients. Um, most native plants don't need enriched soil like that. Um, you know, if you're just using compost from local native local materials, that's fine. But you know, if you're growing vegetables or if you're growing, you know, non-native rose bushes, you know, they need a boost. Um, but our local native um, plants are growing with the nutrients that nature has provided, which is other plants that have just broken down into the soil. So that's good enough. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, Cindy asks a related question. She says, I've been trying to leave the leaf litter in my garden, um, which she says is great, um, but that that seems to enable the voles to have many mm -hmm. surface tunnels and then further destroy plant roots. Oh, I cannot geez. say they are destroying natives in particular. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a mix, but geez Louise, each year I lose perennials and I can uh -oh. see their activity around the lost plant sites. Yeah. Any, any advice or suggestions for Cindy? Uh, get a dog. <laughs> <laughs> if anyone else has an answer to that, 
you know, maybe your leaves are thicker than you need them to be. I'm, I'm totally guessing here. I really do not have an educated answer. Um, if somebody else does, maybe put it into the Q&A and Charlie can read it. But I'm sorry, I can't, I can't help you with that. Uh, so we have another uh, leave the leaves question. Uh, Pam asks, in the fall, I collect fallen leaves and mulch them up <laughs> on the driveway with my lawnmower. The shredded mm. leaves then go on the beds. Is this okay, or would it be better to put intact leaves on the beds instead? Intact is better because there's you're chopping up insects when you do that. I'm sorry to tell you. Um, I know people like to do that because it you know it makes it finer, it breaks down faster. But if you're trying to support the life cycle of insects, it's one of the reasons why oaks support hundreds of species is because when their leaves drop, a lot of insects drop and overwinter in the leaves. Um, so that's why intact leaves are better. And you've just touched on, there's something um, called soft landings that has been getting a lot of attention. Can you describe what that concept is? Are you familiar with it? I just read it recently and I'm not remembering if it's anything different from what I just said. Do you know? Charlie? Well, I, I know a little bit, which is, um, and it's being promoted by Heather Holm um, mm -hmm. and Doug Tallamy. Um, and the notion is underneath trees, native trees, and oaks are a great example, um, to, uh, to, you know, not have grass right up to the tree trunk, which is mm -hmm. good, but to have a bed um, and to leave the leaves so that, um, because many insects that uh, get their start in the tree will drop down to the leaf litter to overwinter. And if you've got grass um, or hardscape, um, they may not survive. Whereas if you have a bed with leaves in it, uh, it gives them habitat to overwinter and, and a, a better chance of, of surviving and, and um, turning into the butterflies and, and bees and, and so forth that will fly next spring. Great. Um, Thanks. Uh, I'm going to remember that now. <laughs> and yeah, and if anyone is interested, uh, just Google soft landings uh, and Heather Holm, and and you'll find it. Yeah, she's um, a she's a bee expert. She is, uh, and a, a terrific one. Uh, Maria asks: In order to benefit the most insects, should I focus on growing a sunny native garden or growing natives in the shade? I have both. Where do I start? Oh, interesting. Hmm. I think if you look at the keystone plant list, that would be the place to start. I think more of them are probably sun plants, but it doesn't mean the shade native plants aren't important. Um, some of the shade plants bloom early because they evolved in wooded areas where they would bloom before the leaves came out. And they're providing really important nutrients for the insects that are emerging early in the spring. A lot of the sunny plants I'm noticing bloom later. So different insects need them all. But I think if you looked at uh, either the Keystone plant list or the Rob Gajir list of the spreadsheet of plants for endangered insects, um, I think you'll get a sense of which ones. I'm trying to think. My guess is sun supports more insects. But again, you want bloom all season. So, um, you know, I'm not being very helpful, I think. <laughs> they're, they're all helpful. But if you want to start in one area, I would start with sun. Um, and then you can add shade plants when you're ready to expand. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Does that sound right to you? <laughs> it, it does. It does. Okay. It does. I mean, yeah. um, plants, there's more energy that plants can capture in full sun. And so that may be a somewhat more productive little mm -hmm. ecosystem than, than shade plants. Um, uh, someone asked, how do fertilizers harm insects? So um, chemical fertilizers change the quality of the soil, which changes. Um, so for instance, native plants don't need chemical fertilizers. They, you know, if they're in, you know, relatively normal soil. You know, if you're in a city where there's been a lot of construction and your soil is, you know, 
construction debris, you need to bring in some good soil. Um, but you don't need chemical fertilizers to help native plants. And I've learned two things about chemical fertilizers. One is they damage the microorganisms in the soil, which are important for keeping plants healthy, which are important for feeding insects. I also heard recently, and I need to look into this research more, some plants, uh, this is just the beginning of some research that I heard about. Um, some plants and insects have a, um, an electromagnetic field around them. So the plants have liquid in them and a negative charge. And those fuzzy bees that are flying around are creating a positive charge. They've actually filmed pollen detaching from flowers and attaching to a bee as it flew by <laughs> because of that charge. And at the same time, they said that chemical fertilizers change the charge of the plant. So nature is so complicated and fascinating. Um, I really think using things that are closest to what nature provides are the best. You know, this evolution has been going on for millions of years and it works. And we, we tend to mess things up thinking we know better. And uh, another reason to avoid chemical fertilizers is the environmental cost of their production. Mm -hmm. um, the energy, um, the rock mining, et cetera, that goes into producing them. Right. Um, one can minimize if one uses the fertilizers that nature provides on your own property. Um, someone asked, daffodils and roses, I am guessing that these are not native plants. Any benefit to them? If I want to replace them with native plants, any suggestions? There are some native roses. So you can find those on the Native Plant Trust website, the Prairie Moon website. I think there's some listed on Rob Gajir's plant list. So they're actually highly beneficial. Um, you know, you're not going to have the variety that you have with, you know, the hybridized rose trade, but there are native roses. Daffodils are not native. As far as I can tell, I actually just wrote to a bulb company to find out if they use any chemicals on their bulbs. And they're in the Netherlands that is very highly regulated in terms of chemical use. So it, I'm not 100% sure, but it sounds like they're safe. They're not, as far as I can tell, they're not harmful. I mean, there's something that you can put in the ground. It's not gonna crowd other things out. It blooms in the spring when nothing much else is blooming. Um, it's not gonna hurt. So there are some bulbs. Actually, if you go to the John Sheepers catalog, there's some that they mark as um, providing pollen for bees. Um, so you could check those. I don't think they're as big and showy as daffodils. I think they're smaller flowers. So there are some that are good for bees um, and some of them just are fun and won't hurt anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, good. Uh, someone asked, does feeding hummingbirds with sugar water in feeders discourage them from pollinating flowers? Yes. So I should do more research about this. But again, it's a situation where, you know, if they're getting a free meal, um, they're not, they don't have as much need to look for food. I, I really should research it because I also don't know about the nutritional equivalent. I do know you have to be careful to keep the feeder clean um, so that, you know, they're not harmed by any buildup of dangerous materials. Does anybody else know more about that? That sounds like one of the things I should put on my research list. Yeah, uh, I certainly don't, but if okay. anyone does, um, please um, make a comment in the chat uh, and we'd love to have your input. You know, um, I'm writing a note. I'm gonna look it up and add it to the email you send out in the next Okay, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Amy, Nick writes, we covered our lawn, which was overrun with invasive hawkweed in black plastic for a year. Mm -hmm. Now we have planted two beds with goldenrod, purple aster, black-eyed Susan, and mountain mint, and a third bed with purple lovegrass. Oh, Nick, way to go. Yeah. We mulch between the plants. There's still a lot of unplanted space. Is there a type of seed we can sow to grow native cover plants? Oh, I would call up Prairie Moon Nursery and ask them. They'll be really helpful to you. I know, I have that too, especially when you put in new plants that are gonna get bigger, but they're not there yet and you have all that space. Um, you know, sometimes I just add more plants, but some annual that would 
fill in and be beneficial until your plants grow up would be helpful. So Prairie Moon, I recommend talking to them. Um, and I, I have a suggestion uh, here. One of my favorite plants, I've become a big fan of it in the last couple of years, is partridge pea, mm. which is an annual um, native to the northeastern U.S. Uh, and uh, it, it grows easily and well and is often recommended as a, uh, a, an annual that you can put in um, between newly planted perennials while you're waiting for them to fill in. And it grows to about two feet high and has a profusion of little um, cherry yellow flowers that bloom for a long time. And it's like it, it, the bees just love it. Um, and I have a bunch planted along the driveway. And when I go out to get the paper in the morning and bumblebees are up early and uh. <laughs> it's just, it, you can hear it from 10, 20 feet away. Wow. You can hear them uh, going at it. So um, partridge pea um, is, is one recommendation that I would have for you, Nick. Oh, that just gave me an idea because I was thinking with the purple love grass, you'd want something shorter. So you might want to get um, violets. Mm -hmm. and uh, prunella vulgaris self-heal so those are highly beneficial they you know they stay low they'll grow around the grass um, and those will flower and be beneficial too but i want to get partridge pea now that sounds great yeah yeah I, one of my favorites uh so pam responded to your earlier answer about shredding leaves and she says, getting back to shredded leaves, I feel guilty now for chopping up all those insects. <laughs> the thing with leaving leaves in beds is that they blow around and anger the neighbors. Oh. If you pile fallen leaves up, say in a container made with chicken wire, will the insects still do okay? What is yeah. the best way to leave leaves in your beds but keep them in place? Oh, I don't know how to keep them in place unless you're kind of tucking them around. You know, like if you leave the plant stems up, they're less, they're less likely to blow around. Um, and I, I think uh, I did this for a while till I put in heat pumps and had to take it out. But I had kind of a big, um, it was probably a, meant as a growing bed, you know, a raised bed. Um, so it was wider than it was tall and I would pile my leaves in that. I think, I don't know what happens to the insects if your leaves are like three feet deep. Um, yeah. but you know, we all have to compromise and don't feel bad. We've all made terrible mistakes. I, I'm not even going to start talking about my bio, biodiversity sins, but you know, <laughs> we learn and we do better. That's the best we, we do. can do. Um, one question that some people have about putting leaves in, um, beds is, is there a danger that you'll smother the, the perennials that you have? Uh, will perennials come up through the leaves. I do think you have to be careful about that. Um, so in the spring, you know, when the leaves are kind of thick and matted and it's starting to warm up enough that plants might be starting to emerge, I go through the garden and I kind of gently pull leaves out that are really thick and I take them out of the bed. You know, again, I'll leave a little thin layer for um, mulch and fertilizer, but I won't leave them piled up on top of the crowns of plants. Um, if you know you have plants that originated in a woodland setting, they can handle it, but a lot of, you know, especially the sunny meadow, meadow plants aren't used to having lots of leaves on top of them. So I'll, you know, I kind of use it as mulch and insulation in the winter and then, and they start to break down, but I'll, I'll thin them out in the spring. Um, Amy, you live in Cambridge, which is fairly urbanized. Can you talk a little bit about the value of native plants in a fairly urban environment and, and sort of what, what people living in urban settings can do for biodiversity? Is it, mm -hmm. is it that useful? It really is. And I can actually give you an example of this. I was doing citizen science research at Mount Auburn Cemetery for a few years where you know, we had a routine of going out and spending an hour and taking pictures of insects visiting flowers in particular areas and documenting that. And then the pandemic came along and they closed the cemetery for a while. And so we switched to doing it on in our neighborhoods. So I'd spend an hour walking up and down my street where people have a lot of gardens. 
and I would take pictures of insects and I found so few until I got to my native garden. I saw more insects in 10 minutes in my garden than I saw in 50 minutes walking up and down this long block, both sides of the street, looking at dozens of yards. So that's my experience. Um, Doug Tallamy also talks about someone who lives right next to the Chicago airport, kind of surrounded by hardscaping, who has lots of native plants and trees and attracts all kinds of insects and birds. Now, obviously, I, I should say, I also garden out in Western Mass in a much more rural area. And I get a lot more variety of wildlife there because I'm surrounded by woods and fields and there's just a lot more wildlife out there than anywhere near my house in Cambridge. But I, I still feel like you can make a difference in the city and Doug Tallamy is encouraging that too. Um, and the more native plants and trees we put in, the more benefit we're providing. And then there's the pollinator pathway concept, which is, you know, if you connect with other people who are doing this and we keep adding gardens and also public spaces can be planted. You know, if you can get your city on board with this, um, or your town, just the more we put in, the more support we're providing. And it, it really is beneficial. So it's worth starting and doing as much as you can and then getting other people on board, including at the municipal level. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, we have time for one more question. And Nick, um, who, we, uh, who sent in a question earlier about black plastic has another question. We have a lot of creeping Charlie <laughs> I prefer the gill over the ground uh, name, but uh, same plant um, on the shady side of the house. I think it's an invasive. Should we mm -hmm. cover with the black plastic or is there a better way to change that area to native plants? I would just, I do recommend smothering, but I would use cardboard instead because we also have a plastic pollution problem. So, you know, lots of people are getting packages in the mail and there's places to pick up lots of cardboard. So I would use that to smother. Um, and then also you don't have to remove it. It'll just decompose. Um, you can, and you don't have to wait till it rots into the ground. You can leave it there for three to six months, put a little layer of mulch over it. Um, and then you can just cut holes into it to plant into it. Or if you're planting seed, you can scatter that on the mulch. Um, so you don't have to take the cardboard out. Just make sure there's no plastic tape on it or anything like that. Great. Good. Uh, well, Amy, we've reached the end of our time. Thank you so much. This has been uh, so informative. Uh, and I know uh, attendees will love getting the follow-up email with all the information that you'll provide. So thank you again for spending the evening with us and, and sharing us um, all your wisdom. Uh, and now I'll turn it back over to Matt to. Uh, wrap us up. Yeah, I'll just echo. Uh, thank you, uh, Amy and Charlie. Uh, thank you, Lexington Living Landscapes, for putting this talk together. Uh, this talk will be sent out in the next coming days, uh, the recording of it uh, with the other information. But I just want to say thank you to everyone for attending tonight. And thank you, Charlie and Amy. I agree. Thanks, everyone, for being here. And Charlie, it was fun to do this with you. <laughs> it was. It was. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Good night, everyone. Thanks for having me. Have a good evening. Good night.